want to give up, where the Christian life doesn't seem to work. We find ourselves failing more than succeeding, and old sinful habits don't go away. Our prayers seem to fall on silent ears, and we can't find God's direction for our life. Maybe some of you are there. The good news is that when we reach the point of giving up, we're really where God wants us. We're ready to live a life of dependence upon him and his supernatural resources rather than just working harder in our own strength. You know what makes the Christian life a supernatural life instead of just a life filled with good moral principles and self-help tips and techniques is the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And one of the things that sometimes a, a new Christian doesn't understand is that when we came to faith in Jesus Christ, we received the gift of the Holy Spirit who now lives in us. We're no longer left to ourselves to try to live the Christian life on our own. We actually have God living in us. But many of us are in the dark about how to live the supernatural Christian life in the power of the Holy Spirit. He's what some people would say is the unwrapped gift that we left in the closet or put away in the attic. And today as we continue our series on the basic beliefs of the Christian life, we come to this section on the Holy Spirit. And hopefully one of the things that we're going to be answering this morning is what is the Holy Spirit for and what does he do and how do we appropriate his power? I once heard a story about a, a man that he went to a hardware store and he heard something about a, a chainsaw. And he said, I, I need to get a chainsaw because I, I'm tired of how long it takes me to cut the wood. And so the salesman said, this is the best one we have. And he, he sold it to him. And about a week later, the man came back and he was obviously very, very frustrated. And he says, it, it doesn't work. It doesn't seem to be cutting the wood. In fact, it cuts the wood less than uh, just myself with the, with the saw. And the guy said, well, it's probably, maybe there's something wrong with that one. So here, here's a new one. I'll give you a brand new one. Try that one out and, and let me know what you think. Well, again, a week passes and the guy comes in. He's even more frustrated. And he says, you know, this chainsaw isn't working. In, in fact, it's just as bad as the other one. And so the salesman this time says, well, let me kind of figure out what's going on. So he takes it out of the box and he pulls the cord and all of a sudden it just, it, it, it's just running perfectly. And the guy is just shocked and he doesn't know what to say. And he goes, what was that noise? <laughs> he didn't turn it on. He didn't power it up. And sometimes that's how we feel in the Christian life. We don't understand that God's power resides in us. We have his presence with us in the person of the Holy Spirit. And this morning, I want to talk about a, a few things about the Holy Spirit that is helpful to us. And we're going to be looking at a lot of different verses, and some of them I have on slides, and others I'll just have you turn to, and we'll read it together. But the first thing is we need to understand that the Holy Spirit has a role in our salvation, that it begins with the fact that he convicts the unbeliever of sin and righteousness and judgment. In John 16, 8, Jesus says, When he comes, he will convict the world about sin and righteousness and judgment. And he goes on and talks about that a little bit. So the first thing the Holy Spirit has done for us that are saved is that he convicted us of our sin. And I don't know if you've thought about it, but you really can't be saved unless you're lost. And so if you don't recognize that you're lost, that you need something, or that you need someone, then you will never be open to the gift of salvation. And God says in his word that it's his Holy Spirit is the one that's at work in our heart, that convicts us. And I don't think this is just about when we first come to faith, it's all through our Christian life. Any of you ever feel convicted about anything? Yep, we all do. We all do. And in fact, my guess is if you didn't feel convicted about anything this week, either you're already perfect 
or you're just not listening to the Holy Spirit. Because there's always things that God is moving us towards or calling us to repent of or, or asking us to have a change of, of mind about. That's the Holy Spirit. Secondly, he gives us new life. The Bible uses the word regeneration and renewing. In Titus 3, 5, it says, He saved us not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy, through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. You know, sometimes the convicting work of the Holy Spirit brings us to a point where we say, I do have a need. I don't measure up to God's goodness. But what do I do about it? Do, do I just kind of go on a crusade to make myself better? Well, that never works. It says works of righteousness that we have done, it, it's not going to save us. But it's the work of God in our heart and in our life through his Holy Spirit bringing us that new life and renewing us. Thirdly, he puts us into a new family, which we call the body of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13, it says, For we are all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we are all given one spirit to drink. The point of this is our unity together in Jesus Christ. That, that God brings us into a new family, a family where color doesn't matter, culture doesn't matter, language doesn't matter, politics doesn't matter, that we're all united because God's Spirit brings us into this new family which we call the body of Christ. Fourthly, in salvation, when we put our faith in Him, He comes to live within us. Romans 8, 9 says, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have his Holy Spirit living in you. I don't understand how that works. I remember when I, I taught a class um, on this, I, I asked the students, where is the Holy Spirit in us? Is it in our hand? Is it in our head? Is he, is he in our heart? Where, where is he? I don't understand exactly how that works because I know that there are some people that have had to have limbs amputated. That doesn't mean the Holy Spirit left them when they lost their arm or their leg or their, their foot. The Holy Spirit lives in us, lives in our heart. Um, kind of hard to express in physical terms. And then it says he seals us. Ephesians 4.30 says, And don't grieve God's Holy Spirit. You are sealed by him for the day of redemption. And that talks about our security in Christ. Once we've come to faith in Christ, God's Holy Spirit comes to live within us, but he also puts a seal on us. And that seal can represent a couple different things. In the Roman Empire, a seal was often wax that was put on a document, and then the emperor or one of the officials would take their signet ring and put it into the hot wax, and you could see that symbol of the Roman Empire. And so what that was was a, a protection or a security, because if anyone broke that seal, they were really going up against the whole Roman Empire. And so the Holy Spirit serves as a, a seal, a security, a protection of us, that Satan can't break that seal, that we can't break that seal, that that, that is the demonstration of God's claim upon us. So those are all those uh, five or six things were all things that happened at salvation. But what does he do now that we are believers in Jesus Christ? And the first thing I wanted to look at is the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians About four years ago, I was, um, I was in Egypt around this time of the year, and as I was teaching a class um, to these Egyptian Christians, I noticed none of them had Bibles. So when I said, turn to your Bibles, they pulled out their phones, and I thought, isn't that funny? And that's the way it's getting to be more and more here. My guess is in Egypt, 
they didn't carry Bibles because of the persecution. Because Egypt's a mostly Muslim country. And so the Christians there, I didn't ask them, I'm just presuming that that was true. They knew they could have their Bible on their phone without people harassing them for carrying a Bible. Um, I thank God that's not the case here. We can bring our Bibles. I like a paper Bible, but if you like the one online, that's fine too. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, 12 to 14 says, Now we have received the Spirit, we have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who comes from God, so that we may understand what has been freely given to us by God. We also speak these things not in words taught by human wisdom, but those taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual things to spiritual people. But the person without the Spirit does not receive what comes from God's Spirit because it is foolishness to him. He is not able to understand it since it is evaluated spiritually. You know, when I read that, I thought, you know, it really makes sense. Because I, I've talked to people, I, I've known people that have gone to church all their lives, and yet somehow they're not understanding God's truth. They can read the same passages that you and I read, but somehow it doesn't sink in and it doesn't do anything. And, and I really believe it's because they have not opened themselves up to Christ as their Savior or God's Spirit to teach them. And it's amazing, once we yield ourselves to God, how the Bible comes alive. It happened for me my uh, first year in college that I read the Bible all the time as a kid. In fact, I was one of those people that felt like, you know, I had to have a routine, so I'd read a verse or a chapter every day, even when I was 9, 10, 12 years old. Never hit me. Like after that point, when I fully yielded myself to God, and he just opened my eyes and my heart to the Word of God. And now it's alive. And I don't know if you've experienced it. If you've never experienced it, there's nothing like it. When you read the Bible and it comes alive and God speaks to your heart and talks to you and shows you and points out, pay attention, this is you I'm talking to. And I hope that's happened for you and I hope it continues to happen. Well, to divine, uh, define the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit, I, I wrote down the ministry of the Holy Spirit which enables a believer to accept, discern, and understand God's truth. So what does the Holy Spirit teach us? tells us that he teaches us what God's revealed, what God's freely given to us in the Bible. And whom does he teach? Uh, believers only. Does that mean an unbeliever can't study the Bible and get anything out of it? No. But they can't get that spiritual food that believers can get. Why? Because of the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit. And so an application... The thought here is the Holy Spirit is the real teacher, but he uses human instruments. In other words, he uses preachers and teachers and evangelists. And in Ephesians 4, it, it tells us that. It says, and he gave some to be apostles and some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ. So part of the gifts that God gives to his people are gifted people, gifted leaders to teach God's word, knowing that they're dependent upon the Holy Spirit. And we as learners are dependent upon the Holy Spirit to, to understand it and to receive it. And you know, the interesting thing about this is we're still commanded to study. And I, I picked out 2 Timothy 2.15 from the King James because it actually uses the word study there. Some of the other translations don't. It says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, regularly dividing the word of truth. That we're to study. It, it reminds me of way back in the middle 70s when I was in junior college. I, I met a guy and he was a new Christian and he was really excited about the Lord and we were getting close to finals. And all of us, were nervous about finals. First year in college, first semester in college, and he was one of these, I guess back then we call them Jesus people. He was a Jesus people, long beard, long hair, kind of looked like back in the 60s what people would call hippies, but now he's a, a Jesus hippie. He's a Jesus people. And so he uh, said, oh, 
I don't worry about it. I just, when I take the test, I pray and ask the Holy Spirit to give me peace about what answer is right. And you know, I don't remember if I saw him the next semester or not. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure if he flunked out or what happened, but God expects us to do our part that we still need to study. Even though the Holy Spirit's the teacher, we still have to open the book. We have to make ourselves available for the Holy Spirit to work and to, to teach us. Another important thought is even spirit-led Christian leaders are fallible in their interpretation and application of God's truth. In other words, the Holy Spirit is the only one that never makes a mistake in his teaching. I've made mistakes in my teaching. All pastors have made mistakes in their teaching. In fact, in Galatians 2, it gives a, an account where um, Peter actually made a mistake. And in this translation, the name Peter is translated Cephas. And in Galatians 2, 11 to 14, it says, this is Paul speaking, but when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For he regularly ate with the Gentiles before certain men came from James. However, when they came, he withdrew and separated himself because he feared those from the circumcision party. Then the rest of the Jews joined his hypocrisy so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were deviating from the truth of the gospel, I told Cephas in front of everyone, if you who are a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you compel Gentiles to live like Jews? This is Peter. This is the one that some churches think of as the first pope, that he was infallible. Well, Scripture makes it clear he was not infallible, that he made a mistake he was in sin here because he was being a hypocrite. Because around the Jews, he acted like Jews. Around the Gentiles, he acted like a Gentile. And that was okay because he was trying to reach them. But the part that was hypocrisy was when the Jewish um, people that they called from the circumcision party, they came, he thought, oh no, they're going to criticize me. So I'm going to withdraw from the Gentiles, pretend like they're not my friends, that they're not my brothers and sisters in Christ. And Paul said, I'm not having that. You need to be rebuked for that. And so, you know, a lot of us have our favorite teachers. And God uses them, and that's wonderful. But just remember, they're not infallible. That God's Holy Spirit is the one that is always the one that is infallible. And human teachers, myself included, we make mistakes. We don't always apply scripture properly. The third major area, the work of the Holy Spirit, is that he guides and leads us. In the key scripture is Romans 8, 14. It says, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. So what he's saying here is if you're a child of God, he is going to lead you. He's going to direct you. If you're open to it. So how does he do that? Well, one way is through scripture. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, it says, All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. God's spirit leads us through scripture. Another one, and scripture is the ultimate. That's the one that we go to first. And some of these other ones are ways that the Spirit of God can work. But we have to be careful. And one of those is circumstances. Romans 8.28 says, We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. If we love God, if we're one of his, his called people then we can trust that he's using the circumstances of our life for our good. So we need to pay attention to what circumstances are going on and how God might be using that to refine us and to lead us and, and to guide us. A, a third one that I have is common sense. Now, I don't know if that's the best word. If you come up with a better, maybe a better category there, I'm definitely open to that. But in Acts 15... In a couple of different places, it gives examples where 
there isn't supernatural guidance going on. It's more common sense based on the circumstances, based on what's going on. Obviously, they were in prayer about this, but the way the Spirit guided them was maybe through their own, their own minds, their own decision-making, their own common sense. It says, Then the apostles and the elders with the whole church decided to select men who were among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, Judas called Barsabbas and Silas, both leading men among the brothers. So they were picking out um, people to send out as missionaries. And it didn't say very much about how God would guide them, so it says they decided to select them. And then it says, we have unanimously decided to select men and send them to you along with our dearly loved Barnabas and Paul. So there was a consensus. They got together. They had been praying about it. They were seeking God. But as these uh, apostles and elders got together, they, they sought consensus on this. And God's Spirit led them that way. And listen to how they, they describe it. For it was the Holy Spirit's decision and ours not to place further burdens on you beyond these requirements. So God uses our minds. He doesn't bypass our brains in guiding us. He doesn't just, you know, give a miraculous supernatural dream or, or speak to us through some strange mystical way. Most often he uses scripture. He impresses that on our minds. He gives us a, a renewed mind as we're in the word. And sometimes direction is that simple. And then open and close doors, Acts 16 6 and 7, they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia. They had been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. When they came to Mysia, they tried to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. There were closed doors, but it says it was God's Spirit that was preventing them, that was directing them, that was leading them. And so as you're thinking about a decision you have to make, pray about it. Be in the Word. See if God's Word will, will tell you something. Be open to circumstances. Be open to, to closed doors. One thing I've realized about open and closed doors is your decisions get very narrowed if the door is closed and there's no opportunity, right? Sometimes we try to force the door open, but we have to be wise in discerning what's a closed door, what's an open door. You know, if, if you were... Um, say, hoping to become a pro football player and you've been working out all your life and, and you know, you're okay in high school and then you're not getting any scholarships for football, that might be a closed door. You can walk on and you can try, but if the coach says, sorry, it's not going to work, that might be a closed door. Or, or maybe you, you get a tryout and maybe you actually make the team and you tear up your knee and you can't play. Could that be a closed door? That can be a closed door too. Um, there are a lot of ways that God works through his Holy Spirit to guide us. We have to be open. We have to be prayerful. We have to seek counsel. We have to be in his word. And then the last one, and this one is one that I, I think can be misused probably more than any other. It's through our heart. Um, Luke 24, 32 says, They said to each other, Weren't our hearts burning within us while he was walking with us on the road and explaining the scriptures to us? This is shortly after the resurrection of Jesus Christ where the disciples were on the Emmaus road and he appears and walks with them and opens up the scriptures and there was something going on inside that was the Holy Spirit's witness to them about what was being taught to them. In John 16, 13, it says, When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but he will speak whatever he hears. He will also declare to you what is to come. The specific application here was for the apostles. And I think it's talking about the inspiration of Scripture. But there are times when God puts a burden on your heart. Have you ever felt that? Or you, or you, or you felt a compulsion or you felt a, a burden Maybe you felt like God's laying someone's name on your heart and you decide you're going to call them and they tell you, you know what, I'm so glad that you, you called me because I've been struggling with this. You know, I don't know for sure, but I'm pretty sure that's probably the work of the Holy Spirit in your heart as you're walking close to the Lord. 
Then Romans 8, 16 says, The Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. That affirmation, that encouragement, that assurance. And then fourthly and lastly for this morning, we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And there are a lot of examples of that in, in Scripture. Um, there were some that took place before Jesus' um, death and resurrection. Uh, talks about John and Elizabeth and Zacharias and, and Jesus in his early ministry. And then after Pentecost, um, there's a number of occasions as well. I'm going to just take a minute and I want us to turn to the book of Acts if you want to follow along or you can just listen. But over and over again, it talks about these followers of Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit. And in, um, in verse 4 of Acts 2, at Pentecost, it says, Then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them talking about they were given a gift to speak other languages. And it said that was the result of being filled with the Spirit in the upper room. Turning over a, a couple chapters to Acts chapter 4, verse 8, it says, Then Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit and said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, and he goes on with his sermon. So somehow he was empowered, inspired by the Holy Spirit, says he was filled with the Holy Spirit to declare this message. And then in the same chapter in verse 31, it says, when they prayed, the place where they were assembled was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God boldly. In this case, the Spirit's filling gave them boldness to speak the word of God. Um, in chapter 6, uh, verse 3, it speaks specifically of deacons. It says, brothers and sisters, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we can appoint to this duty. So as they were seeking out deacons or servants to serve in the early church, they said one of the requirements is that they're filled with the spirit. Um, I'm not going to go on to read all of these. You can look them up. I think I have them in your outline. Um, six and seven talks about Stephen. Um, one of the early Christian martyrs being filled with the Spirit. In 11, it talks about Barnabas. In 13, about Paul. And later in 13, about some of the other disciples. But each one of these were examples in the New Testament uh, after the death and resurrection and ascension of Christ where his followers were filled with the Holy Spirit. So what does that mean, first of all? Well, let's look at probably the clearest teaching um, on this, all of these other occasions are more narrative or they're descriptive. This is actually a command in Ephesians 5.18. It says, do not get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, but be filled with the Spirit. And for those of you that are, are um, grammar people, language people, um, in the original, um, the word for filled with the Spirit is a command. It's what we call an imperative. It's something that we are to allow to happen to us. And it's plural. It, it says, um, but all of you be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's, that's maybe a more literal. Or in the South, y'all be filled with the Holy Spirit. Everybody, not just one person. Um, it's passive voice, which means it's not you doing the action, but it's something that you're allowing to happen to you. So you're allowing yourself to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's present tense, meaning continuous, to, to keep on allowing yourself to be filled with the Spirit. And so for a definition, I have the unhindered ministry of the Holy Spirit in and through a believer's life. And the, the Greek word for a filling, pleroma, is control. It, it's obviously not a literal filling like you know, you fill up a container with water. It's the idea of being controlled. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're controlled by the Holy Spirit. Kind of like if you're filled with anger, you're allowing anger to control you. Or if you're filled with jealousy, you're allowing jealousy to control you. But here the command is to allow God, through his Holy Spirit, to control you. 
So what blocks that? I don't know about you, but there are times in my life when I definitely sense that God's Spirit is controlling me. I'll, I'll say something, I'll talk to someone, I'll have a forgiving spirit, and I'll think, that isn't me, that's not my normal. Um, God's doing something. He's working in me. And sometimes it doesn't happen. And sometimes I think, what happened there? You know, I really blew it. It didn't sound like the new me, the, the Christian me. Well, I think there are some conditions for being filled or controlled by the Holy Spirit. And in Romans 12, 1 and 2, it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It begins with presentation. We have to offer ourselves to God. We have to say, God, please use me. Please fill me. Please allow me to be an instrument of yours. We have to yield ourselves to him. It also tells us that we have to separate. We have to have a change of mind. We have to not be like the world. We need to not follow that path, but we need to allow ourselves to be transformed. And how does that happen? It happens through the Holy Spirit's teaching ministry through his word. A second condition is in Ephesians 4.30 where it says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. One of the things I, I didn't mention here is that there's a lot of people that think of the Holy Spirit as the force from Star Wars, this impersonal power. Uh, the Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is a him in Scripture. Holy Spirit is the second person of the Trinity. And because he is not a power or a force, but a person, we can grieve him. We can make him sad. And so he tells us here in Ephesians 4.30, don't grieve him. Because the idea here is that we are not going to be controlled by him if we're grieving him. What does it mean to grieve him? Well, I think it's anything that we know is wrong. But we decide we're going to do it anyway. That grieves the Holy Spirit. I think it kind of short circuits his power in our life. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, it says, Do not quench the Holy Spirit. And what does that mean? Well, I put down through a refusal to obey God. Some translations say, um, Do not uh, put out the flame. In other words, if God's Spirit is moving you in a direction, or you're reading God's Word and you think, You know what? I'm messing up. I need to confess that, I need to change, I need to turn around, repent, do something different. And you go, nope, I'm not listening, I'm going to do whatever I want. That's quenching the spirit. He no longer is controlling you because you're intentionally disobeying. Galatians 5.16 says, walk in dependence upon his power. It actually says, walk by the spirit, you'll not gratify the desires of the flesh. But that's the thought there that you're walking dependent upon him, upon his power and his presence. And so those are just a few ways to be filled, to know that he has control in your life by presenting yourself and separating yourself, allowing your mind to be transformed, not grieving him, not quenching uh, him, his work in your life and walking in dependence upon him. So what happens when we're filled with the Holy Spirit? What are the results? Well, Galatians 5, and 23 describes it as fruit. It says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. When I'm not experiencing that, when I don't have God's peace, when I don't have his gentleness, his faithfulness, his self-control, I know I've not allowed the Spirit to control me that I'm holding back, I'm either grieving him or I'm quenching him, I'm not walking in dependence on him, I'm doing things in my own strength. Ephesians 5, 18 to 21 talks about what happens when we're filled with the Spirit in relation to one another. It says, instead be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, 
and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Another sign, another test to, to ask yourself, am I filled? Am I controlled by God's Spirit? Well, what's going on inside? How am I relating to other people? Am I glorifying God? Am I praising God? Am I submitting to one another? Out of reverence for Christ, it's a sure sign. Acts 1.8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. He's given us a responsibility that when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, when we're saved, when we're yielded to him, when we're open to his control, we're going to be witnesses. We're going to be able to share with others with his power, what God's done in our life. In conclusion, we must live in dependence upon the Holy Spirit. If we want to live the supernatural Christian life, we need to depend upon God's Spirit. Galatians 5.16 says, Walk by the Spirit, and you'll certainly not carry out the desires of the flesh. It's kind of like watching a baby walk. They don't just get up and run, Right? In fact, some babies take a long time. I remember seeing some of our, our kids and grandkids, they're barely able to crawl. They're not up and walking. In fact, sometimes they crawl backwards. That's one of the craziest things. Have you ever seen a baby kind of, they want something and they start going backwards? It's just, it's, they haven't learned yet. It takes time. It's a step at a time. And that's something that we need to learn to do in our Christian life. Galatians 5.25 says, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Don't run ahead of the Spirit. Don't lag behind. Allow God's Spirit to walk with us step by step. It's not always something that we can feel. It's not always something we experience uh, tangibly, but often it's an attitude. It's a mindset of reliance and dependence and yielding and surrender. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you that we can come to you at this time. We thank you that you haven't left us alone, that you haven't just said, here's the rules, go ahead and do it. But instead, you've given us yourself in the person of the Holy Spirit to live in us when we come to faith in you. So, Father, I pray that we would allow you to take control, that we would not grieve your spirit, that we would not quench your spirit, but that we would keep in step with your spirit. And Father, I pray that if there's anyone here that has not come to faith in Jesus Christ and doesn't have a relationship with you, that they'd listen to the convicting work of the spirit in their life today, that they'd turn from their sin and accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior and receive the gift of eternal life. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Let's all stand together as we sing hymn number 354, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. We'll do the first verse. <clears throat>